So welcome everyone to TAM Lab number 21. Uh, today we have Bill Hill joining us from sunny Portland. Uh, he's going to be going through a VMware Identity Manager or a VIDM Deploy and Config Lab, uh, which I feel like is uh, very pertinent. We've got a lot of Horizon stuff going on, at least in my realm lately. I've, I've been doing a lot of Horizon stuff, so this is perfect. Um, and with that, that is all I have. So, Bill, anything I missed before no. I hand over to you? No, I think, uh, I think good. I'm good. All right, we'll take it away. Awesome. I'm going to uh, talk about uh, IDM. And I think uh, IDM, what I've seen with my customers, uh, is probably really underutilized. I think there's a lot of companies out there that could just use the portal that IDM provides. Right, so what we're going to do in this um, in this lab is just kind of walk through what the setup looks like of IDM, connect it to um, a domain, right? So we can do some authentication and then publish some applications, right? This isn't going to hook into Horizon, but it certainly could. It's not going to hook into a lot of things, right? There's a lot of different ways we can go with this, but. Um, you know, my intention is actually I'll, I'll take this and maybe even show it to one of my customers. Just say, hey, look, you know, you guys have a ton of apps. This one customer has a thousand apps in their business and they have no way to organize them. It's all domain knowledge. You get hired on, you ask the guy next to you, right? There's little sessions during team meetings where they say, oh, I just found this thing, right? So let's give them something to, to collect it. So with that, I'll start sharing my screen um, and then we'll get going. Give me one second here. Share. Cool. So this is my home lab. Uh, if you can all see my screen, it's VMware Workstation. Uh, nothing too complex, uh, but I don't need it to be. So uh, what I have running here is I have the, the virtual appliance. Um, I've already deployed it. Uh, it's just like any other virtual appliance. You're going to give it a couple pieces of information like network, um, addressing, do you want to join the, uh, the CEIP, things like that. Um, with the default deployment, I think it's two vCPUs and six gigs of RAM. Uh, it takes about 10 minutes to start after it's been deployed. So there's lots of little um, queues, queuing services that start and, and um, application services. So nobody wants to sit through all that stuff. So that being said, here it is deployed. It's plain vanilla. Um, I'll swing over a browser and you can see what this uh, setup looks like. Um, <clears throat> so I'll just go ahead and move through this. First thing we're going to do is set up some passwords, right? Uh, so we can log into the admin UI, root, uh, and even SSHN, right? So I'm just going to use our good old uh, VMware one. Right? Nothing too exciting here. And last. Cool. Oh, doesn't like this one. Sorry about that. Like the top one. There we go. Okay, so um, next on we're going to select which database to use, right? So um, this can leverage an external database or it does come with an internal uh, Postgres. And so I'm going to leverage that. Um, this threw me for a loop when I first tried to set it up. Um, I was using an IP address to connect instead of a host name uh, in my browser. Seemed pretty, pretty passive. Uh, this will fail if you're using an IP address. It wants you to use a host name. Um, and it'll pop up a little error message. I could have shown you what that looks like. Um, pretty obnoxious. So you know, using a host name is going to be a, a better successful experience. So I'll go ahead and just say we're going to use this internal database. It's going to chew on it for a minute uh, and gives you nice status on what it's doing. Nothing too complex. Let's see here. And I should say, while we're waiting here a minute, if you have any questions, please interrupt me or any, anything you feel like you want to add. Um, this version that I'm, I'm running on here is 3.3.0. Uh, um, if you're hip to IDM in the EUC space, we actually have a newer version of this. Um, it's 1903, and it's the first one to use our new date-based versioning. 
like we're seeing in some of our other products. The reason I'm not using that is uh, there's the concept of a connector and the connector is what lets you connect IDM to another identity provider like Active Directory. Well, in 1903, you need to license that connector. It doesn't come pre or available to you um, and you have to hop over to your AirWatch console and all of this stuff. I don't have access to that. So I went back to 3.3 because fundamentally it's the same, you know, what I'm trying to show you. So it's not the latest and greatest bits, but uh, the concepts are all the same. So um, anyway, so with that, we're here, we're all set up, let's start using it. Um, since I haven't uh, established any, any alternative uh, authentication, we're just gonna log into what they call the system domain um, with this admin user that I set the password for just a couple screens ago. Cool. Okay, so um, let's see here, I guess, first thing we're gonna wanna do is connect it. Um, actually, no, I wanna license this thing. All right, so if I go to appliance settings here, on the left, we're gonna have an option that says license. Pretty straightforward, let's see if this is gonna work. So can you purchase this product standalone? Because I think I've only ever seen it come like, you know, the bundled version of it with VRA or for Horizon, right? You know, that's a, that's a really good question. Um, I don't know if you can. I've only ever seen it, to your point, as part of a, a, a Workspace ONE um, or a Horizon Enterprise. Hey, Steve. Nathan here. How are you doing? Ah, of course you know the answer. Hey, Nathan. <laughs> um, so, yeah, you're correct. It would only be available as part of Workspace ONE. And you do get it with other products like uh, VRA, but I don't believe when you get it through VRA that you're entitled to use it for some of the things that I'm sure portal. you're going to show, like single, yeah, the portal, the single sign-on. It's there in the back end, but really the only way to get this is either through a Workspace ONE or if you uh, have a Horizon customer, you can use it with Horizon if you're accessing Horizon resources. So the desktops and apps, you're That's entitled right. to use it, but you can't use it for single sign-on to say SaaS apps like Office 365 at that point. Right. I know you also get it if you own the vRealize suite because you can do a standalone vIDM and point things like LogInsight or vROPS and then of course vRA into that as well. So, but like you said, not all those published applications, it's really just there to, to do authentication. Mm -hmm. Yep. Cool. All right. So um, go ahead and add a new directory here. And I'm going to pick uh, Active Directory. Um, and so we're going to use, uh, you know, I had that, that SOM before Active Directory um, session that I did before. And so we're going to leverage that same um, SOM before directory versus Microsoft directory services, right? Um, so I'm just gonna roll through here, right? We have uh, the idea of the connector. I'm just using the one that was uh, provided, right? So I'm just gonna accept some of these basic values. Uh, you can actually change the attribute for, well, directory search attribute to UPN. Um, there might be use cases for that. Um, for what I'm doing with this, just to get it up and running and poke around, I'm just gonna keep the default there. Um, right, so I'm gonna look at, uh, where do I wanna search for my objects? Right, when I do a sync from the domain. Uh, so I'm gonna search at the root. Um, I'm going to, uh, I have a, a service account set up that can actually bind and, and do queries and, and, and uh, interact with the domain. Um, and no surprise, my password is VMware1. Cool, so um, it's able to see things, um, authenticate and whatever else. So I'm gonna go ahead and hit next here. Real quick, Bill, yeah. I, I must have missed it. If you scroll up on that, I don't know if you can because it's I don't know. forward, but how did you, you didn't point it to, I guess that is, is that a specific domain controller or would you just let <clears throat> DNS kind of? Uh, yeah, so any domain controller? the directory name is what it actually points to. So that's my, that's my domain controller. And then this DNS service location um, oh, actually looks at the, the, the records, the various records and whatnot. So if I were to, I, 
I hesitate to do it now because it's thinking. Um, if I were to uncheck that box, you could start seeing that it says, hey, specify a specific server to connect to. Um, got it. Server, okay. The Perfect. Server. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. So I got a single domain, vb.info. So we're going to go with that. Uh, next up is going to be mapping user attributes. Again, I don't have a reason why I would want to change those, but there might be a reason depending on the domain or the, uh, the, the directory behind the scenes, um, what their schema looks like. Um, for this, I'm totally fine. It's worth noting that there are four fields that are required. And that's important because if you provision a user, like a service account, and you don't have an email address, it's going to fail. And then you're going to troubleshoot, why are my users not failing? Not that I've done that. Uh, why are they not syncing, right? So it's, it's important to notice there are a couple required fields, and if you don't complete them, that user will not move over. Um, so again, just, you know, I have the whole array of schema objects here um, for these different objects. Again, why you'd want to change some of them, that's going to be a specific uh, environment. You might, you might do UPN for the username. Oh, yeah, UPN's down there, there we go. Okay, so next, uh, we're gonna talk, talk about groups, right? How are we going to identify where the groups are that we wanna sync in, right? Leveraging Active Directory to manage our users and groups, that's, that's not a paradigm that's new. Um, so let's continue leveraging that. So I'm gonna go ahead um, and we're gonna pull uh, groups from the root. Let's see if it's just auto saved in here, it's not. Now this ends up being kind of ugly because there's lots of systems, system groups. Um, there's 40. And you can see it's, it's all of these, right? Um, I wanna sync them all because why not? Uh, that, could be, that could be an issue in a customer environment based on you know, how big their environment is, what makes sense, what their use cases are. So again, for a lab and what we try and do, it's probably just fine. Uh, next up is, the users, where do we want to sync users? So I'm going to sync from uh, two locations. Why I didn't just search for the root, because I wanted to be different, I guess. So one is an OU that, um, that's called VB users, right? Uh, the other one is just a users, where the default user accounts like admin get, get created, or administrator at, at domain. There we go. Next, invalid request. Oh yeah because I don't have CN equals, whoops. So this is OU equals, let's give that a shot. Cool. All right, so now it's gonna actually give you a, an idea of what's gonna happen. We're gonna bring over five users and 40 groups. And when look, the domain admin account doesn't have an email, a last name and a first name. Right? It's not going to sync these over. Um, same with the service account called IDM query. Um, and then, you know, guest and, and probably was that Kerberos or something like that, right? So you get a sense of why these um, aren't going to sync. And I'll go ahead and hit sync here. Um, and at this point, these users are going to become available for us to, to leverage inside of Identity Manager. Um, I want to share, let's see, let me refresh the page. You can see that the sync happened uh, and we still have those four alerts, right? We have some users that we've tried to catch in our net that um, aren't valid, right? Because of those required uh, fields. Um, the initial sync, and I didn't call this one out, uh, it's scheduled to run once per week. And that, uh, that's kind of interesting, right? Depending on your environment and what you do, that might not be good enough. Right, so we have the option here of saving what the seek frequency, the sync frequency is. Right, and so you know what, I'll run it every 15 minutes because it's my lab and it won't be on for very long probably, and I don't have enough churn in my environment. So every 15 minutes, I'll go ahead and hit save, and now it'll run every 15 minutes. Again, I, I had a, a customer who had just set this up, and they were they were confused why they just added a user to an OU and they weren't showing up yet, right? So I'll go ahead and hit sync there and we'll just, nothing changed. 
All right, so at this point we have a domain. We can see some more information about what's going on with that domain that we just connected to. This all looks very familiar. There's a couple things now that you can't change, right? It's already been configured as AD over LDAP. You can't, you can't change that as much as you might click. Um, let's see, I'll cancel this, but here you go, Steve. So I unchecked the uh, DNS service location. And so now you actually point it to a specific um, server. And if they have a global catalog, let's see if, oh, it's not letting me do that one. Anyway, um, you know, now you can actually allow Active Directory users to change a password, which is really nice. Assuming that this account, um, I believe, I have to double check that. I think it's if this account, but anyway, I'll go ahead and cancel that. Oh, one more thing I wanted to show. Uh, you can actually change some of those sync settings in here, right? So how often, where are we looking? Oh no, it should be something else, right? So you have the ability to go back and change some of these settings. Um, this last one here also caught me for uh, a loop too. Uh, a sync might fail when you're actually trying to add more than, let's say, 5% of identity managers from an existing group. So if you do a bulk load or you add a new OU to the environment, um, or maybe it's an acquisition, right? Something like that. Um, if it sees a significant change, it's going to fail and you have to kind of manage that yourself because the process of pulling from the domain controller and syncing all that data could impact availability and performance. Um, yeah, that's, I actually just saw that with one of my customers that's using VRA because obviously they're using the embedded identity manager there. So what oh, yeah, they did yeah. like three months ago is they made a bunch of changes to AD and then it triggered one or more of these safeguards because it was like more than five users or 5% of the users were being added or removed, yep. which means it didn't sync for three months. And we went in there and we're like, what the heck, what's going on? It wasn't yeah. a big deal. Nobody really noticed because there's only a, a core number of folks that are using VRA. Sure. Um, but yeah, it, it wasn't syncing. So we had to kind of force it to ignore the safeguards just to get it kind of back on track. So oh, that's really interesting. You know, and you know, <clears throat> and me setting this up, I went through the process and it only synced one user and I was like, Oh, I need to go back and add email addresses, right. To these service accounts that I created for, you know, for the lab. Well, when I tried to sync it, it failed because I was adding like four users and I already had one in there. Right. So if you do the math, adding four users is well more than 5% of the existing. Right. Right. So um, it failed. <clears throat> I thought that was kind of silly. I get the, I get the reasoning, um, but it can catch you off guard. So I'll go ahead and cancel that. I don't want to make any changes in here. Um, you can also look at, again, the, uh, the actual identity provider and then the sync log, right? Again, useful for identifying when it hasn't been running for three months and uh, why that might be. So you can come in here and kind of poke around um, on this connectivity. So we got that all going. Um, I'm going to go ahead and set up a couple uh, policies because I think the policies are uh, unique and very useful. Uh, you get more policies as you, I think if you add AirWatch to this as well, you have some more abilities um, for policies, but I'm gonna add just a couple basic ones here. Uh, first one I'm gonna add is, so I'm gonna go to policies. I'm gonna add a network range, right? So we can act on allowing access to applications based on where you exist. Right, so it comes out of the box with one called all ranges. I'm just gonna add one called um, on network. And so uh, my home lab just leverages the NAT interface um, on workspace or on uh, workstation, excuse me. So it's gonna be 192.168. So for me, it's 147.0. Just see. Cool, so now by defining this network range, I can say this application's available if you are on net or if you're remote, right? It may, might not be there. Um, next thing I'm gonna do, let's see, yeah, good, um, is I'm gonna add a couple policies themselves. Right, so this first policy I'm creating is only access from on network. Great, okay. And I don't have any applications yet, so we're just gonna leave this stuff blank. Okay, 
So we're going to add a rule. And so I'll, I'll walk through a couple of these things so you can get a sense of um, what our options are, how flexible it can be. Um, so here, if a user's network range is here on network, I just define that, right? We can also restrict based on, are you in a browser? Are you using something on a mobile device, Windows or Mac, right? For this, this case, I'm just going to say all device types. Um, you know, are you on network and part of a group, um, right? So this is qu querying my, my domain, you can see here at vb.info, right? So I could pick any one of these things. Maybe I want you to be a domain admin. I don't know, I'm gonna leave it blank. Um, if you're on network, I wanna authenticate you with password. Right. If we have more authentication methods, two-factor, things like that, you can also start adding those in here. Right. And then re-authenticate after eight hours. Right. So they leave their browser open. You know, something like that might happen. Um, if there's an error, you know, maybe we want to redirect them to the IT help desk or something like that. Again, I'm just going to leave all of these at default except for on network and authenticate with password. Okay, so there's my policy. Now you can see here, you could add other policies. Uh, again, I'm just keeping the one and save. So we got that new policy. We're gonna be able to play with that here in a minute. I'm gonna do one more. And this is gonna be power application users, right? So um, if the network range is all ranges, that's totally fine. But this time I wanna do, uh, users who are in the Power Apps group. And then we'll do authenticate using, oops, uh, password. Perfect. All right, next and save. Okay, so now we have these policies, right? So policies are gonna allow us to influence whether or not you can see something, right? Um, what re-authentication looks like, things like that. So it's really, it's an important uh, component out of this. Any, any questions so far, any? A uh, quick one, Bill. Yeah. Um, is this where you would also set up like multi-factor authentication, like first authenticate with a password and then some other method as well? Yes, yeah, yeah. So let's go in here. Um, I'll just edit this guy, it doesn't matter, I'll cancel it. So if we go to configuration and edit this policy, right, if I had another factor configured, right, we're gonna have the ability to, you know, use this if it fails, then use oh, gotcha. Else. Add a, you know, so you, we can add like, I see, I see. Yeah. <laughs> you know, ah, we can go crazy. Um, I don't want to work at this company. Yeah. <laughs> Nobody does. <laughs> I bet that, you know, getting firewall access is really hard there. Um, yeah. So I'm going to cancel that. So the next thing here is a bit obnoxious, but it's the way this demo application works. So the next step is going to be actually plumbing this to look at a handful of applications. Let's go ahead and publish them so they're available to our users. Uh, one of them is a SAML application. Um, it's actually something that VMware um, provided uh, through GitHub a couple years ago. Uh, and it's really nice, except um, in this instance, it requires you to know what the SSL cert is uh, because it's gonna bind, it's gonna look at the SSL cert from the identity manager and say you're an authorized um, source for this SAML application. And that cert doesn't become available until after you get everything set up. So I wasn't able to really <clears throat> pre-stage this part. Um, so this isn't something that you would normally have to do, but it's what I need to do for the demo. So give me one second here. So I'm gonna go ahead and um, using OpenSSL from this uh, Linux application or this Linux server, I'm gonna reach out and grab the SSL cert for my IDM um, instance here. So give that one second here to complete. And then I'm gonna, um, let's see here. So that looks normal. Next thing I'm gonna do is actually import this into a, a Java key store for this application. I know, not the most exciting thing. I, was, I, I tried different ways to get around this and such is life. Give me one second. Okay, yeah, cool. What did it not like import? Key store, because there's no dash. There we go. 
Um, if you have customers or even in your home lab, um, you're interested in, you know, how do I ver verify some kind of SAML app? Um, again, I'll include this um, as part of the, the artifacts from this session, but it's just a VMware provided project on GitHub. Um, really good documentation out there on how to leverage it. Um, it'll also, there's also other um, options in here as well I can show you in a second. Um, so I need to rebuild this real quick. Almost there, you guys. Thanks for being patient with this one. Cool. Okay, this could have been faster if I used a Gradle daemon. Okay, well, no for the future. All right, last command here, just restart the service. Cool, okay, so back to, back to what we're all here for. Um, so next up, we're gonna uh, publish some applications for our end users to use. So we'll go through a couple different kinds. Um, one of them will absolutely fail, but it's still important to show you. So we'll, we'll start here by going to the catalog, right? And so this is where we're gonna show the different applications that we have. We can do a web app, virtual apps, you know, whatever else. We're sticking to web apps for now. Um, and I'm gonna create some categories. This lets us organize and filter and, and whatnot. Um, so I'm gonna create two, or four, sorry, four categories. So you see here, you just type it and then hit add. Great, so there's search. Uh, problem solving and power apps. Great. So now you can see these categories exist. I know they're kind of gray, might be hard to see, but these categories now I can start applying to my applications. Um, so the first one, let's publish a new web app. Um, you can see here that as we start through this, we have a catalog of services that we've already kind of predefined how we connect to them, right? So for our customers, this could be very handy. And as you uh, browse through all 104 of these, you start seeing interesting ones that pop up, like, like social cast. Of course, we're gonna put, you know, links to some of our own things. We, we make them, we consume them. Um, but, you know, Office 365 is in there. Um, I just take a stab, moving through, um, Dropbox, right? So a number of these uh, solutions in here that we might find um, our customers would want to use, Google Apps, things like that, Fresh Desk, Fresh Service, all of these. Um, they're here for us. Well, in this instance, I'm not gonna worry about that. I'm just gonna go up the Google homepage. This is gonna be a, uh, a basic, Got a pictures tam lab. There we go. Google. Okay. And what do I want this one to be? We'll call this one search and productivity. I forgot the you know, description, right? Uh, I'm gonna solve all of your problems here. Next up is how do we authenticate to this service? Well, this is probably one of the most basic ones that we're gonna have out there. It's a web application link. So you can see that all my options just kind of shrunk away, right? This would be really useful if you have, um, you know, maybe certain docs that you have, you know, a customer wants to publish potentially in their environment or, you know, take you to a login for a service that we can't authenticate against, right? So in this instance, pretty basic. We're gonna go to Google. Okay, there we go. All right, next up, we're gonna do one that I know will fail, but let's, let's talk about this one. So a lot of people use Office 365, we do. Um, so by selecting that from the portal or from that catalog, you can see a lot of this information is already pre-populated for us now. Saves us a lot of time. 
I don't know, this looks like the Office 2007 icon. I'd rather use something a little more modern. Category, we're just gonna call this one uh, productivity. Excuse me, that seems like the right, the right approach there. Again, now it's WSFED 1.2 has been automatically selected. We can't change that, right? It's going to give us things like the target URL, app ID, things like that. Um, as you start doing more integrations with SSO and things like that, you know, hopefully the provider has a document that shows you just exactly what to do here. Um, you know, with Office 365, you're going to usually have your UPN as your username format. Um, this one, I'm putting in dummy information because the reality is I don't have a tenant in Office 365 and that's why this is going to fail. Um, these are required fields and I'd be nice if there was a little star by them. Um, you have to put something in there for this to, to continue. So next, now we have our access policy. So you can see here, here's what we defined earlier on, right? Um, but you have the ability to add additional policies, right? Specifically, this says for username and password clients. And so if I click this policy, it looks similar, but you can see now, hey, if the user's client is Outlook or Boxer. So interesting, right? Now it's not just kind of more IP, like where are you or who are you and what, what's your group, but now it's what client are you using, right? Um, oh. Email protocol. Are you using ActiveSync or POP, right? So now you can start getting a little granular on um, the different policies. You know, if you're using POP, then maybe you can only do it for a couple minutes, I don't know. Um, anyway, I'm gonna leave this alone, but just know that it's nice that you can start acting on not just who a person is or where they're coming from, but also additional attributes around what they're trying to do. So again, leaving these all as default, I'm gonna hit next right and save and there we go so now we've now published an application to office 365. Uh, last one is going to be to that saml application that we just created um, give me one second here i'm just going to do some copying and pasting from a different screen okay it's not in the catalog so i'm just going to go ahead and not even bother with the catalog. And this is our super important line of business application. Uh, I'll put the fancy TAM lab icon in there. Uh, productivity and power apps. Power apps, productivity. Nope, did I not save? Yeah, oh, there they are, perfect. Next, all right, so in this instance, um, again, it's a SAML app, we saw that by just virtue of being on that Linux machine. It was called SAML. I'm gonna go grab the, um, there's an XML file. In fact, let's see if I can just pull it up here. I can do it from here. Oh, it's a uh, three and probably Okay, so um, if you're not familiar with SAML applications, you'll probably at some point be prompted to download um, some metadata. It's gonna describe a number of things. So I'm gonna go ahead and grab that from my downloads. And edit. And you can see it's a bunch of garbage, right? Lots of information about certificates and who I am and stuff like that, right? So I'm gonna go grab that. Oops, I'm gonna paste it right in here. Great, um, if I go to manual, you can actually see here, you know, you have to type in what's the, SS, uh, the SSO URL, all of these pieces of information. I'd rather just go to the service and dump in an XML file. Um, You know, I don't have any reason to add any application parameters. This is a very specific application. It'll probably just work. Again, access policies, maybe I want this to be 
only access from our network. It's so important, it has a lot of IP, right? I don't want that to, to leak out uh, publicly. So at this point, we have three applications, um, which is really cool and not really useful because we haven't actually assigned them to anybody, right? So at this point, we have an Active Directory domain, not doing a whole lot. So let's link, uh, let's link these things together. So give me one second here. I'm gonna use this Google group, go up to assign. Awesome, now, one thing you may have noticed earlier when I was actually creating a new app, blah, blah, blah. Uh, I wanna change this to web real quick, web application. There's an assign, there's a save and assign option here. I didn't do that in, intentionally, but you know, you don't have to publish apps and then assign them. So as you work through a workflow of just adding apps, you could also go that, go that route. But in this instance, I'll just assign, um, this, is, this is Google, so this is going to be power users. Seems kind of silly that it's power users, but how often is it you know, that IT people go to Google to solve all their problems. Um, our SAML application, we're gonna map to all users. Let's see here, is that the problem? Yeah, save. And assign, same with Office 365. Okay, so let me check. I'm just double checking one thing here. Automatic cool. So at this point now, we've stood up the environment, connected it to a domain, created some policies, published some applications. Um, I'm going to swing over to a um, machine I have uh, on the domain. Hey, Bill, real quick, we have a question in the chat from Eric, uh, and I think it's more geared towards everyone on the call. Uh, just why would a customer choose the on-prem version of VIDM versus the SaaS-based offering that we have? And a follow-up to that is, what are some of the adoptions you see in the field on-prem versus SaaS? And, That's a good and I, question. I can't answer that, but I know there's some folks on the call that might have some, some input. Yeah, I mean, I, you know, I'll, I'll just share my experience, right? I have a, a couple customers who, um, one government, and they, don't, they haven't established a trust relationship on, you know, how well do I trust anything being in the cloud? They'd rather see it on-prem where they feel like they can leverage their current security models, right? Um, to go ahead and, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, to, to secure it. So they, they, they trust that they can manage it themselves. But if there's anybody else on the line that has better answers than what I've seen, then please, by all means, chime in. Yeah, I would agree with that. I mean, I would say always go with SaaS first. Um, but you're right, some government customers particularly and others will not use those kind of services. Um, one thing to note, particularly with VMware Verify, that's a cloud only offering. You mm -hmm. can use an on-prem VIDM deployment and use VMware Verify, but the actual VMware Verify functionality is always coming from the cloud. Uh, and then the other thing that's different is the release cycles for Actually, I'm not sure if this applies to VIDM, but certainly for the Workspace ONE UEM, uh, the release cycles for SaaS are every month and the on-prem, I don't think they've decided exactly what release cycle it's gonna be, but it's not as frequent as the SaaS one. So new features are going into SaaS and they won't necessarily be available on-prem for maybe three to six months after they were available in SaaS. Um, although I'm not sure if that includes VIDM, it certainly includes Workspace ONE UEM. Mm. But, but I mean, we're seeing that common across all of our cloud offerings, right? That things go to the SaaS, SaaS yeah, version first. Exactly. And it's definitely the way that I think everything's going to get pushed. But it's particularly true for Workspace ONE UEM and VIDM because they fit very well into being a SaaS offering because generally it's for, well, a lot of external users are gonna hit it anyway, so it makes sense for it to be on the cloud. Can you speak to the functionality as far as SaaS versus on-prem? Like, would it look exactly the same as far as going in here and configuring applications and things like that, or is it 
Uh, yes, um, it's it's pretty much the same. There's a couple of differences again because of versioning. So like where you saw virtual apps, the configuration for that is a little different now. Uh, but it's mainly just UI changes. Okay. Um, and then the other big difference is you obviously need the you have to have the connector deployed on prem to be able to link to your Active Directory, your Horizon environments, Radius for two factor if you're going to use that. Um, but yeah, the GUI is pretty much the same. Cool. Awesome. Thanks, Nathan. Yeah, thank you so much. Um, all right, so I guess what we'll do real quick is we'll just kind of log in and show um, what the experience looks like. So I didn't change any certs. It's gonna be untrusted, that's fine. Now that we've actually connected to um, another identity provider, we can select whether or not it's system or again, my domain. All right, so this is gonna be our test user of like admin because they're the ones that seem to use Internet Explorer still. There you go, doesn't have access to everything, just what like we wanted. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and log in here. Uh, IDM. Similar, you know, different browser. This is gonna be a different user. Um, this will be my task worker. Okay, that makes sense. And then the last one here, I'll use Chrome. Maybe, there it is. I'm a power user. Okay, power user gets everything, right? All the apps, of course, because that's how IT likes it. Um, so if I go ahead and just click this guy, just like we use our Workspace ONE internally, there you go, it opened up Google. Very important for them to research problems for users or something like that, right? Um, Office 365 portal is going to fail. <laughs> yep, because I didn't configure it right. Um, but that was expected. I just, again, wanted to show what that, that catalog process looked like. And then last, uh, we're gonna look at that really important SAML site, and I'm hoping this works. Here we go, got my SSL cert. Right, I'm going to SAML now. Look at that. I'm logged in as a power user, right? If I come over here, do the same thing. Advanced, yeah, accept, resend. All right, task workers logged in. Um, and if I go here, I think you'll, you'll get the sense, continue. I'm logged in as executive admin, right? Um, if I go back here to my browser that has not authenticated and I go to this SSO login, right? This is a, you know, I went directly to the SAS app or the SAML app itself without going through Workspace ONE. I haven't authenticated, right? It's not happy. So that being said, that's, you know, the end. Um, oh, no, no, I apologize. It is not the end. I'm so glad I had my notes. There's one more important thing. Branding. This, uh, this application is, or this Workspace ONE is pretty vanilla. You know, it has our logo and stuff like that. I wanna change it because this is Tam Lab, right? So um, let me pull up in this Chrome, there we go. So it's pretty easy to change what the, the branding looks like. Um, if we scroll through here, you can see we have a bunch of options on background colors and effects and images and stuff like that. Same with VMR Verify and then out of the box, um, experience, things like that. Um, and you'll notice on the right side, there's a little mock-up of what the environment looks like. And so as we change settings on the left, we can see what it looks like on the right. I'm gonna change just a couple things. I'm gonna, I'm gonna put our TAM Lab um, logo up here. You can see it's reflected over in this tiny little corner over here. Um, I'm gonna change a color going to be this one here, right? So you can see this font now changed from whatever it was to, to uh, orange. 
which is nice. I'm going to change, um, let's see here, pictures, backgrounds. Here, upload, confirm. So now again, you can see that the background here changed and we have those little triangles, right? We've seen that on our own uh, Workspace ONE implementation. Uh, you can get rid of them. Just check a box, right? Um, so at this point, I'm gonna go ahead and hit save. Here, so end user portal changes may be reflected in five minutes. There is a command that we could run if we really felt strongly to force it to happen sooner. Um, in my getting ready for this lab, I found it was actually pretty quick, but let's just see. All right, so if I refresh, let's see, maybe I have to kill it. Sign out. Sign in. All right, so this one must be, take five minutes. So um, sad to say, if we just drag our feet a little longer, we might see it happen. But branding it is easy, but branding it is important, right? Because the goal for this portal is that for, to, for it to be a part of your organization, right? You wanna make it fit in and take on as much of your company's culture as possible. Otherwise it looks really sterile and it's just another thing that people have to remember. So putting a friendly logo, you know, um, I had uh, one of my customers put, you know, their state agency or entity, right? So they put the flag of their state up there, right? Um, they also go through roughly quarterly and they change the background to something that's relevant for them, mountains and snow and fishing and stuff like that. Right, so um, you can really do a lot here. Um, I've seen uh, other customers that actually have a contest within their company to say, hey, um, submit a picture and um, we'll put it on a monthly rotation, right? So if it's a nice, you know, um, in fact, actually, uh, my company prior to moving to VMware, we were a shipping and logistics company. And so we did something similar with our corporate intranet where it would just be, hey, we're a travel, you know, logistics company all over the world, send us a picture from where you are, right? So there's all kinds of ways you can get users involved in something like this, but you can really integrate it into, again, their culture and how they operate. So it feels like something they wanna be in and not just another page with links. So I'm gonna try one more time. Maybe I just need to kill it all. And if it doesn't work, you know, if it's not updated yet, then ibm.vb.info, there we go. There we go, look at that. So now we have that cool space background, right? We have the TAM Lab logo up here, the orange font, uh, things like that. So anyway, that's, that's all I got, um, so. Hopefully this was useful. Any, any questions, comments, thoughts? You know, is this something that you think could be adopted more? Hey, Bill, can we pop back into the admin? Just yeah, sure. Give me a second here. Yeah. Um, one of the things I, when I was poking around in here, I don't know, maybe two years ago, I was kind of doing this for a customer. Um, if you click on the top right, there's a little monitoring icon there. Uh, I guess that takes you back to the dashboard. Um, well, it takes you back to the dashboard, but it's specific information about the health and availability of the service itself, right? right? Whereas so, the dashboard might show you, you know, how many users have logged in. And, and like that's that. what I wanted to show, right? So this is cool, just kind of an overall health of the system itself. But then if you go back up to dashboards and look at, I guess, more of the monitoring of the applications and the users, I thought this was really cool because we use this internally, right? But we never get to see this side of it. So like how many users are using these applications and how often, and I think it would be really interesting to see uh, our own IT kind of show some of the, the statistics, right? Mm -hmm. That'd be interesting. That would be really interesting actually. 
Um, but it, I think this is powerful, right? So you can see, are users even using this platform? Are they using this application we've given them, right? Especially if it's a licensed application, I feel like that's where it really comes into play is like, Oh yeah. You know, we've, we can see you're not using this thing, but we're paying a monthly license fee for it. So we're taking it back. Right. Lots of so, reports. Pretty yeah. cool reporting abilities here. So yeah, I went to dashboard and then the system diagnostics, which was the equivalent of clicking here. Gotcha. So any other questions from anyone? we got about two minutes to go. We're good. Great. Thank you, Bill. Thanks everybody for joining. And if there's nothing else, have a good week and a good day. Perfect. Thanks so much. All right. Take care.